I live. I die. I live again. Sarah. Who are your shining friends? Well, time for that later, Doctor. Come on. Welcome, humans, exelons, and ranks of sentient city to the 109th episode of an unearthly podcast, streaming live on the 3rd of June, 2015, and featuring Death to the Daleks, written by Terry Nation. I am Bill Sylvia, the man in black, and with me are Matt Matt Winchell. Hello. Randy Ronson McCulloch. Oh, it's a pleasure. And Aaron Romeo Moon Burke. Have another light news week this week. Uh, Aaron, did you want to start with that uh, personal news you mentioned? Was that something you wanted to bring up? Um, sure. I've actually just gotten a uh, position with uh, Fun Curve, which is a company that uh, wants to uh, apparently showcase some uh, internet reviewers' uh, writing talents, uh, featuring uh, Kore- uh, pretty much a Korean uh, and Japanese drama, probably also maybe some Chinese drama, I'm not sure, but then also anime and video games. It looks it looks like I'll so. Try to, okay, I do uh, remember you bringing that up at one point. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, right now it's unpaid, but there is uh, the chance that it could be a pay- eventually a paid position if the uh, website does well enough. So, And it looks, nice. apparently, this the guy running it, and Andrew Chang. I believe he was also involved as a product manager for Raptor in I think EA. So yeah, he's he's worked in the industry a little bit, so mm-hmm. it could be interesting. It mention- looks like they are they are. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was just gonna say you, you mentioned that it's a web- writers. Oh. You, you mm-hmm. mentioned that it's a website named Fun Curve. My first thought, knowing the internet, is that it would be a porn site for larger women. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, why would, why would you yeah, work for that sort of site? The internet is for porn. <laughs> They're probably lucky they got it. <laughs> yeah. Or, uh, no, actually, the, the, the porn website is Fun Curves, plural. <laughs> of course. I, I keep wanting to call it Funcom. Yeah. Randy would, me. Randy would be like, God damn it, how would you get a job with Funcom? Why would you get a job with Funcom? <laughs> I wouldn't Be exactly jealous. think it to be a stable job right now. Yeah, I mean, it talk about, you know, bad management decisions. Jesus. <laughs> uh, while we're on personal things, I do have one thing that some listeners might be interested in, which is that, uh, well, for a while I've had a lot of people want, trying to get me farther into... Game of Thrones slash Song of Ice and Fire, depending on which media you follow. As a primarily book person, I wanted to read all the books before getting into the show. So I've been reading uh, the second book, A Clash of Kings, this week. Um, And it definitely has turned my opinion up from being, you know, yet another nothing special light fantasy series to one that, at the very least, focuses on the most interesting characters. So while half the plot, half the book is regular plot stuff that's nothing special, the other half is focusing on you know the characters that actually make it worth reading the book. So I am enjoying the series and plan to continue it. Yeah, and eventually I I'll start actually, on the show. Yeah, mm-hmm. I actually have read the first two books, started the third, and have watched uh, about a season and a quarter, I think, of the show. Okay. The show is a, is essentially um, a distilled uh, uh, version of the books. Mm-hmm. Um, Although I hear that they do uh, go in different directions with some things, but I don't know. Uh, I think I, I, from what I've heard around the third season, I think they start to branch in a different direction. Yeah. Um, Although I, I know there has been a bit of a controversy lately because they've just been 
in order to gain excitement, cramming in extra rape scenes without actually having them impact the story. From what um, it seems, to be I, I, I didn't under, I didn't, th I didn't hear so much rape scenes, but there has been many um, brothel scenes that went into a little more detail than they did in the books. Ah. Because yeah. which, okay, that explains why a few years back everyone was like, "Oh my God, Game of Thrones is about boobs." I'm like, we have the internet if you really need to watch yet, that. Yet, yet at the same time, mm -hmm. there are scenes in the book where characters are naked, and they aren't in the in the uh, show. And I'm like, really? Well, to be fair, yeah. the main character that I remember from the first two books having naked scenes is a teenager, which is illegal to air in the United States. Um, okay. Um, no, well, there's a scene in the first book where, um, Ned Stark's wife crawls out of bed naked to read a message. Ah. And she wasn't naked in the show. Everything else I remember pretty much happened as it was supposed to happen, and they just were very tastefully cutting, um... Uh, underage nudity. Ah. Well, uh, if you guys, if you liked the second book, um, or if you thought that it made it a little bit better, um, the third book, in my opinion, is probably I, I the hear best. The th I hear the third book is the best. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, the only reason I haven't <laughs> continued reading the third book is I got sidetracked by other things. Guacamelee. Yeah, well, that that's currently what I'm playing. But yeah, there was that, and you you dropped Watch Dogs and Shadows yep. of Mordor in my lap, and both of which you finished in like a week. Yeah. Each, like you, and I'm talking about like doing all of the content that was available on the discs in like a week in in like a week per game. Well, I get those long stretch of time where you're you're asleep and I'm still on on energy where I wind up playing them. And of course, I don't have a job yet. Mm -hmm. That may change in the near future. We will see. Okay. Uh, any, I'm any currently other personal I, news anyone wants before we go into our, our meager bit of Doctor Who news. Um, I've I've applied to a few job openings myself, but we'll wait and see if anything happens with that. Otherwise, uh, as I mentioned before, I would like to bring up a little bit uh, on Kung Theory. Because it is something nerdy that should be mentioned and should be shared with all. I've heard the name, but I can't place it. Kung Theory was a, I believe it was a Kickstarter movie. It's a 30 minute long movie. And essentially the director, writer... Uh, wanted to stop doing music videos and commercials and start doing something else. And he really felt the urge to make a very 80s-esque uh, action kung fu movie. And he successfully made one of the craziest things I've ever seen. Essentially, a police cop is struck by lightning and bitten by the cobra at the same time and gains unimaginable kung fu powers and is uh, apparently destined to be a martial arts uh, expert, which also has the attention of Hitler, who comes back, who comes into the future to try and kill him, so he ha finds a super hacker to hack him back into the past to try and kill Hitler, before Hitler so tried Stanley to kill him. So Stanley wrote the plot of this movie, and the guy from the Kickstarter directed it? Huh? Said, so Stan Lee wrote the plot for this movie, and the guy from the Kickstarter directed it? No, the guy from the Kickstart did all of it. It, it, it is it is a zany thing. Um, Aaron, you've seen uh, Blood Dragon. I've seen the commercial for Blood Dragon. Yes. Um, think that more or less. And actually, yep. I will sh sh actually, I've seen people actually share the entire movie, so actually I will look up the trailer for this really quick and you guys can have a quick quiet look while it plays. Because apparently the uh, owner of the movie has no problem with people sharing the glory that is this movie. Um, it also came out with a movie uh, uh, the, it came out with a game either the same day or the day after. It's about two bucks. It's $1.99 on Steam. 
but however, I find it to be uh, essentially a mediocre uh, uh, one finger death punch knockoff. It only has one level, it doesn't really do all that much. Uh, also, I would add that this is Swedish, and the original actors also do everything in Swedish, so it even lends into the bad dubbing stuff. So, here's the trailer for all to see. Um, it also has a music video, it has uh, a cliffhanger ending, kinda sorta, so there's maybe a possibility that if people really liked it enough, the director might try to fund a second uh, movie. I thought it was hilarious and completely out of its gourd, which makes it even more hilarious. And besides, how often do you see a actual three-story tall um, uh, Thor come out of the sky and smite Nazis with a hammer? And lightning bolts. So, I, uh, well, obviously I don't want to give too much away, so that's about as much as I'm going to talk about it on that. So, have looks, a look if you this like. Looks like a, it's very, I mean, this uh, trailer looks like cutscenes from a Tekken game. <laughs> in, in, somewhat interesting, although I do find it odd that they use a, such a long trailer for such a short movie. It's two minutes and 20 seconds. Yeah, for, I mean, like, two minutes and 20 seconds is what you'd expect for an hour from, like, a two-hour, 20-minute movie. I mean, a trailer from a two-hour, 20-minute movie. I feel like for a, you know, for a shorter movie, it should be, like, a 45-second top trailer. Otherwise, you mm. give too much away. Actually, they give very little away except for the time-traveling thing. And, of course, Hitler and fighting Nazis. Mm. Looks interesting, though. Oh yeah, it's a fun little romp. Again, it's only 30 minutes. It's hardly going to be a waste of time. It barely is long enough to be a noticeable amount of time. Alright. Uh, so does that about cover us to move into our uh, normal news, then? Yep, yeah, I have something mm -hmm. I'll talk about after the news, because it's kind okay. of movie film stuff, which gotcha. we typically do after the news. Right. Probably. All okay, right, so start off our uh, lost story slash obituary yep. for the week. We have a couple of them, and I will talk about the first. Is actor Bob Hornry has died at the age of eighty-three, which is a good run in our book. Mm -hmm. um, from the Doctor Who standpoint, he played uh, the. Scorian battle cruisers pilot in the fourth Doctor story Horns of Neiman. That was 1979 um, with Lala Ward as Ramana uh, co starring. Um, he's an Australian actor. He's best known for being in the soap opera Neighbors. Um, he was a long standing member of the Melbourne Theatre Company. Um, mm -hmm first appearing in their 1961 tour of Sweeney Todd. His <laughs> last appearance was in 2011 uh, doing uh, The Importance of Being Earnest. He has included TV roles in Sapphire and Steel, Orlando, Nicholas Nickleby, The Glenn Thomas Show, and Thunderstone. Um, in in uh, big movies, he, was, he had a role in Cracker Jack and was the water seller in Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome. A brief but memorable part. Mm -hmm. He died two days before his 84th birthday. Oh. And that was last Tuesday, and we're only hearing it now, of course, because he died in Australia. Mm hmm. News travels slow from mm -hmm. Australia. Yeah, he's not all that, and he's not as big of a celebrity as some people. So the news isn't going to hit, you know, major papers within within hours the same way it would for, say, when Leonard Nimoy passed. Within mm -hmm. 24 hours, the entire world knew about it. Yeah. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. So let's go on to our next uh, obituary. Yes, our our next loss is uh, Peter Howell. So looks like he uh, he looks like he played one of the uh, Time Lords. Um, I'm not quite sure. No, he was. I don't have I much. Know, I think played, the name of the role is described in the article. Um, yeah, he played the out. investigator. I don't in have the any 19- article. You gave us no article. You didn't give us uh, any the, articles. The, 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 the obituary the article, article for there. mine uh, it's, had yeah, both same, obituaries. Hmm. Oh, uh, he played the go. investigator in the 1972 story, The Mutants. Yep. Yeah, okay. Uh, that was, yeah, that was age a, of 96. That was, a, that was, I should, we should... Uh, specify that was the Pertwee story, the mutants, not the mutants not, that not was part of the Daleks. Of right. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. Yep, for, he was best known for his role in the 1960s medical drama Emergency Ward 10 playing Dr. Peter Harrison in well over 100 episodes. He had roles in Dr. Finlay's casebook, The Ten Commandments, Free Wheelers, Edward the Seventh, The Mill on the Floss, Pride and Prejudice, The Prisoner, Love in a Cold, The Prisoner, Love in a Cold Climate, Death of an Expert Witness, Crown Court, A Source of Innocence, Our Mutual Friend, actually, and Perfect Strangers. Actually, just a brief interruption. I think they meant to put a comma after The Prisoner because I one of the images I included there is from the show The Prisoner. So I think yeah, it's there's, Prisoner, mm-hmm. comma, Love in a Cold Climate. Yeah, that makes I, sense. I was going to say, that's kind of an interesting sounding movie. <laughs> Speaking of his roles, apparently he has something in common with Christopher Lee because he played Saruman in uh, BBC's 1981 production of The Lord of the Rings. Yeah, cool. if, uh, uh, the, the 81 production, not 91. But, um, did, yeah. Did I, uh, I, did I say 91 by accident? Yeah, you did. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. 1981. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah, I would. I if I if I had this article, I would have started it with, "Well, Saruman is dead, but not Christopher Lee." <laughs> um, we should also specify that this is not the Peter Howell that wrote the '80s Doctor Who theme. That is a different Peter Howell, who is, I believe, still alive. <laughs> that is Probably. Peter Howell, the composer, not Peter Howell, the actor. Doctor Who just likes to suck up Peters. Yeah, apparently. <laughs> All you Peters are belong to us. If your name is Peter, you will at some point work for Doctor Who. If you're, if you go into the either the music or acting business in the United Kingdom. Yes. You may not be largely, you know, you might not have a major role in Doctor Who, but you might, you know, a bit part like this this poor man did. All right, so moving on with our news, uh, we go on to our big finish a little earlier than normal, but we've got uh, a few big finish pieces here. The first is that The Early Adventures uh, is uh, has announced a Series 2. Now, The Early Adventures is a range uh, that was kind of inspired by uh, what occurred in Light at the End when the first, second, and third Doctors were recast for the first time, uh, and apparently uh, at least... So, some, several of them, if not all, uh, were liked well enough that they decided to commission them for regular stories uh, for Doctors that had initially only been done through the Companion Chronicles. In this case, Fraser Hines will be playing not only uh, Jamie McCrimmon, but also the second Doctor. Um, and with I believe, him, uh, I believe we, we said that was the best of them, didn't we? Mm-hmm. Yes. Fraser he, Hines he, he, he was, was pretty was well closest. spot on. Yeah. Although uh, the guy they've had doing the third Doctor has improved since Light at the End. Well, now that he's getting it in more than just a reading a story part, right? He's yeah. like, I actually have to act now. <laughs> but all of uh, all of the second Doctor's companions are coming back, except for of course the uh, late great Nicholas Courtney, uh, Annika Wills as uh, Polly, or or sorry, except for the two deceased uh, because uh, Michael Craze is also. Uh, who played Ben Jackson, has also passed. Uh, Annika Wills is playing Polly. Uh, Deborah Watling is playing Victoria. Wendy Padbury is playing Zoe. And uh, newcomer Elliot Chapman will be taking on the role of Ben Jackson. So uh, that'll be so something they've already for fans recast, recast Ben. To to. 
As soon yeah. as they find somebody, they'll recast the Brigadier too. I, I part of me it's really gonna be is hard looking because... forward to that. Part of me isn't. So yeah, uh, yeah, I know he is such an. Well, who, iconic... who are they going to find that can do that? Can be Nicholas Courtney? Like that's not going. to... That's. It's going to be hard. That's going to be, be very yeah. hard. hard but the, I'm sure somebody out there could do it. I'm sure. Of the, sad, that. Yeah, the sad I'm, thing I'm, is, I'm... if Nicholas Court, if Nicholas Courtney was still around, he would be the one that I would want to do the Third Doctor as well. <laughs> I think um, you yeah. could probably pull it off with a clipped accent. You know, a clipped mm -hmm. uh, tone of speech. You could you could pull a pretty close one, but they would still the, have to uh, probably look around. Right. Uh, the series will begin in September with Simon Garrier's The Yes Men, featuring the Doctor, Jane, uh, the Doctor with Jamie, Polly, and Ben. Uh, so mid-season four. Uh, then is the Forsaken by Justin Richards with the same cast in uh, October. In November is The Black Hole, again by Simon Garrier, this time with Jamie and Victoria. And then in December is the ISOS or ESOS Network by Nicholas Briggs, uh, this time with the Doctor Jamie and Zoe. So they are going through the entire Second Doctor era in an abbreviated period of, period of time uh, with uh, all of these. And, uh, yeah, so Second Doctor fans have something uh, to look forward to. That sounds a train. Yeah, oh, that was a I thought yeah, someone was we... trying to play... I thought someone was playing music to get me to hurry along and move on to the next article. No, it's someone no, trying to no, drive a train there's... through the plot. <laughs> yeah. Ah. there's a, um, We're not that far from the train tracks, so every now and then we'll, we'll get a locomotive that goes by. I, th I think it's happened in the past. I just forgot about it. Well, you know, during the wintertime, our, our windows are, clo are closed, so it muffles the sound. Gotcha. But right uh, now... The article also mentions... Go ahead. The article also mentions that the Series 1 uh, from 2014 is available in its entirety on BigFinish.com, and that the first Doctor, along with his companions, which is going to be very interesting, will uh, return in 2016 as series or for Series 3. So I'm kind of curious how many first Doctor companions they're getting back or, and, uh, or if they're sticking with ones they already have. It's unknown at this point. I, I, I think that they've been having uh, William Russell, uh, who is Ian, play the first Doctor, if I remember right. I might be wrong. And I remember that. him doing it pretty decently, too. So. Yeah. He's a little closer to the first Doctor. Well, yeah, he's a little closer to the first Doctor's age than he was in the 60s, so he might be able to pull yeah. it off. Yeah. I bet. Well, actually, I'm pretty sure he's older than the Doctor was in. Yeah. Because uh, you got to remember. Hartnell was only in his fifties when he started. True, yeah, they they aged him up. Although his, I mean, his illness also helped in making him come off as older. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, considering that it's been Doctor Who has been around almost as long as William Hartner, Hartnell had years uh, in nineteen sixty three. Yeah, he is definitely closer to the Doctor's age than Ian's. Yeah, definitely. Um... Hey, who next one? All right. So, good news for all Big Finish fans. Um, Big Finish has announced that they have extended their Doctor Who contract through the year 2020. Woo. That means that they have another five years extension on making Doctor Who, and that is including all of their ranges... Um, uh, including Doom Coalition, Torchwood, Fourth Doctor Adventures, Unit the New Series, and everything else they're currently working on. Um, that means that the range has been extended through March 2020 when the 262nd story will be released. That, I, I don't know, will that make more big finish audios than there's actually been Doctor Who? I think maybe if you count mm -hmm. other ranges, they're already at that point. Let me just see how many Doctor Who serials we have to date. And I think I think the list I'm going off counts uh, season 23 as one serial, but still, it's a rough estimate. 
Uh, as of the end of as of the end of 2015, we should be looking at. Okay, actually, well, as of the the stories we know from 2015, it will be up to 257. That's as of episode eight. If it's if it's all two parters, that's about three more serials from there. So we're looking at about 260 stories by the end of 2015, televised. Um, and again, okay. I think that's counting season 23 as a single story. And then, and then we're hopefully having five more seasons on top of that. So yeah, actually four more seasons because the 20 if, if they're airing the same way as they will, the 2020 season of Doctor Who won't air by the time they do their March special. Right. Um, but not in addition, they're going to memorize, the, they're going to um, mark the occasion by having eight separate ranges, one for each big finish Doctor. And they're going to have them all with special bundles so you can make buying a specific Doctor easier. Although, if we're lucky, by then they might have two or three more Doctors. Maybe, but that's going to be a separate contract and a separate announcement. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, let's see. And, the, and uh, they, I'm sure, will each have their own range, because who gets David Tennant or Matt Smith and doesn't, you know, give them monthly releases? And special for the month of or June... Box sets. They are making a special extended subscription on both CD and download, which is 350 uh, pounds for CD, 350 pounds for download. Um, runs uh, for 42 stories, um, starting from anywhere the listener requires between story 216 and 221, pretty much through the end. Or, you know... Or unless, of course, they get their contract extended again, which, you know, I doubt they'll be stopping anytime soon. But um, we'll go through through the end of the current contract. So that is what's currently uh, there. They are working on uh, more uh, main range at the moment, as well as all of their other lines. And so we're not going to be running out of Big Finish Audios anytime soon. Definitely not. No. Good to note that if we run out of classic Doctor Who episodes, which I think we still have enough, I think, I think Bill, you said for what, three, four more seasons at least? At least, For yeah. off, off, resu- off reviews, um, that we can always start uh, relying on uh, Big Finish Audios to start filling the gaps. So... I think that's all I have to say about that. Next. And that would be the Doctor Who Companion Chronicles. First Doctor Volume 1. And that's about ready to be released here. Companion Chronicles continues with a new four-disc set with more to come in 2016. Our much-lived series of Doctor Who Companion Chronicle Adventures returns with a new four-disc set set of stories featuring the companions of the first Doctor, starring Carol Ann Ford, Maureen O'Brien, and Peter Purves, with uh, Alex uh, Dunmore, Alice Haig, and uh, Darren Strange. Alright, and these stories include The Sleeping Blood by Martin Day, The The Unwinding World by Ian Potter, The Founding Fathers by Simon Gurrier, and The Locked Room by Simon Gurrier. So, yep, and it's available to buy and download here. And then uh, the uh, second part, uh, yep, Second Doctor Volume 1 will be coming up here soon, too, uh, about June 2016. I do want to know, I don't like the title of this box set. What they've essentially done is the Companion Chronicles were previously released in series. So, you you know, you would have, you know, series 1, I think it's 1 through 8. This is, they're switching to box sets, so they're calling it Volume 1. So this is not a new series, rather, essentially, they're repackaging an existing series so that they can essentially sell them four at a time instead of one at a time. Yeah. Hmm. Looks interesting, though. Particularly if you're a fan of the uh, first Doctor's adventures and the companions involved with them. Now, what does this do, um... Okay, yeah, so it looks like, um, 
Looks like uh, the doctor is incapacitated, at least in the sleeping blood. And that forces uh, Susan to uh, to explore, uh, try to figure out what's going on, and uh, try to find him some help there. Which is actually kind of similar to uh, what happened in Planet of the Daleks, with Joe leaving the TARDIS and having to forge for help for the doctor. Actually, that's kind of interesting. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay, looks like it would be a pretty good series. Mm-hmm. Again, big fan and, uh, we trust them. Mm -hmm. So that uh, that wraps up our Doctor Who news for the week. Uh, we do have one other piece of sci-fi news that we've picked up, and uh, this is a spoiler for an ongoing comic series, so if you are following... Um, actually, actually, I had heard it was Darth Vader, but apparently this was actually Star Wars. So if you're following the Marvel Star Wars... Uh, main series, I would recommend averting your ears for a few minutes. And your eyes, probably, because I'm sure it's on screen at this point. Uh, but this is uh, recently released with Star Wars number six, which ends on the cliffhanger of a woman. Uh, we're pretty sure she's human, although the art here is a little questionable, but we're pretty sure she's human, stating that she is Santa Solo, wife of Han Solo. So... While this doesn't necessarily contradict anything in the uh, Legends universe, it most likely will lead to things that do. So this is uh, going to be interesting going forward with the next few issues of Star Wars. Also, she uh, announces this in plain view of Leia, so that's going to be an interesting conversation. <laughs> hmm. Oh, it could also my. be a red herring. Um, it's possible. I mean, you know, we don't know the entire story here yet. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I'm, I'm not. I mean, a lot of places are placing a you know a larger importance on this. I kind of see. I mean, for all we know, she could be to Han what Saffron is to Mal Reynolds. So, it's really up to what comes over the next few months. And these comics are considered canon for the new. Uh, Yes, Disney, there, there is Star Wars. You know, there there is a single story team that is coordinating the movies, the comics, the novels. Everything is controlled by the same group. Okay. So this is possibly part of canon, although this could be just a short story arc, and this woman is just kind of out of her gourd and and says she's Solo's wife. For all we mm. know. Could be. So we'll have to wait and see. It's, it's worth noting for those who aren't following the comics that all of the current Marvel uh, comics are set uh, within uh, in about in the year following A New Hope, essentially. So this is all you know well before Empire Strikes Back. Oh, uh, that's right. Of course, Marvel's doing the comics because Star Wars is owned by Disney, and Disney owns Marvel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Duh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Marvel just bought the rights off of Dark Horse, so... Yes, Mar 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 so Marvel... Back. Well, I don't know if they bought... I, I think it's more just uh, Lucas Lucasfilm licensing did not renew Dark Horse's contract, probably. Yeah, also that's so weird. I've sure. always... For the longest time, I've always associated uh, Star Wars with Dark Horse comics. Yeah, it's it's only the, it's, it's only the, I mean reason. obviously uh, yeah. except for the earliest comics in the seventies and possibly yeah seventies and eighties where they were first published by Marvel just wasn't this it? Year. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And none of those are canon either because they're all part of well they're part of before Legends anyway they were dubiously canon even to begin with. Mm hmm. Okay. I believe Randy had something you wanted to bring up uh, before we yep. go into the episode. I have, right? a, I have a couple of casting notes. Um, first, I'm going to go with the non-comic book news. Um, there have been rumors circulating around that there was going to be a sequel made to the, cl the cult classic movie Big Trouble in Little China. Um, it is not going to be a sequel. It is now officially a remake like everything else Hollywood's been putting out. Um, and the remake of this movie, they have now cast the role of Jack Burton, and the person they've cast is Dwayne The Rock Johnson. <sighs> yeah. 
Yeah, it kind of seems that they've already lost the point. Yeah, they're um, putting a big, muscly, burly guy who's supposed to be able to do anything in most of his action movies and placed him over the putts. Yeah, that's the thing. It was Kurt Russell played basically the character of Jack Burton while being the narration for the for the for the movie and thus in his eyes the main character was actually the sidekick to um the Chinese guy. Uh it, it depends. If it's more of the normal action stuff, Jack Burton could step in and do a little something. But if it was down to the kung fu crazy stuff, then yeah, his, his the guy who would normally be the sidekick turned into the main character for a little while. Yeah, but that was kind of the way it mostly turned out to be, considering the fact that they were fighting an ancient Chinese emperor. Well, yeah, that's the yada, last yada. action and now, sequence, and though. They've cast, <laughs> and they've cast that with, you know, the with The Rock, who's, you know... As somebody put it, he's the eight-foot golf guy that grabs you and throws you up against the wall and asks you if you've paid your dues. Whereas Kurt Russell's the guy that looks at him straight in the eye and says, yes, sir, the check's in the mail. <laughs> so it yeah. looks like this is going to boil down to another case of Hollywood not getting it. And taking anything um, that originally had John Carpenter's name on it and fucking it up. Yeah. The other thing that I wanted to mention is another casting call. This uh, within the DC universe uh, for DC's web subscription service. Um, the role of Static Shock has been cast, apparently. This is not confirmed by the people, uh, by the companies, but uh, was confirmed by one of the producers, I believe. And they have cast Static Shock and given the role to Jaden Pinkett Smith. I have questions. <laughs> now, albeit, as long as they don't have a cameo by Suicide Squad's Deadshot, which is being played by Will Smith, Jaden may have a chance. I have seen him act on his own, and he acts better on his own than he does in a movie with his father. True. Wait, did Whether you say Jaden or Jaden? Jaden, the son. Okay, I thought you said Jada, and I was like, how in the world is Will Smith's wife going to play a teenage boy? Okay. No, well, Jaden. When your name is Jada, why the hell do you name your son Jaden? That's a very good question, too, to be honest. I mean, I, I, well, it's naming the kid after the parent. That's not uncommon, but it can get confusing yeah, if you have I the know, same career. Yeah, I know, but it's yeah, exactly. And I don't I don't think he had a lot of choice in in the, in that career because you know getting pressured by both his actor father and his actor mother. But um, I don't know if he has the power to actually play Static. I mean, the charisma for it. To be fair, the, t the things that I've seen him in so far were a remake and an M. Night Shyamalan movie. Yeah. So I don't know if I can judge him harshly as you know as I would based on those two performances. I haven't seen him do a damn thing worth any good. But again, mm -hmm. they were he's kind of shoehorned to really sloppy and, things to begin with. So. And, and um, Will Smith is which, one of my favorite which actors. Which remake and he did was you? Uh, Karate Kid. Yeah, I actually liked him in Karate Kid. I, mind you, mind you, the relationship him. story they had was a little creepy, but yeah, I actually like I, I actually liked that movie be better than I I actually liked that movie better than I liked the original, and I rewatched the original. <laughs> um, and the the original is so um, dated at this point that that was the reason I liked it, the I, new I one. I feel better. like I feel like the remake is already dated. Mm. Just from what I remember of watching it in theaters, it, I feel like it was one of those, you know, in the moment movies. But that said, I can't really yeah. judge off of uh, what was it? After Earth was the name of it? No, was it? After yeah. Earth, I think it was yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, no. I, 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 I keep every time I say that out loud, my brain <laughs> goes back to Titan A.E., which is a completely different movie, which has a similar name because they both have After Earth mm -hmm. in the name, but. Yeah, even Will Smith was terrible in After Earth, so I can't really 
judge the actor uh, himself. Yeah. Will Smith was a block suck. of wood in that. Will Smith it's, was a freaking block of wood in that. It's and an M. Night Shyamalan movie. He makes everyone into a block of wood. Now, I have seen a couple of things where Will Smith and Jaden has been in the same movie. And um, generally, yeah, um, Jaden becomes very quiet and um, is overshadowed by his father. But DC has been making a lot of really questionable casting decisions. Yeah. Now that said, if he could, like, if he could channel his father at a younger age, like thinking back, you know, if we could get the Fresh Prince as Static Shock, that would be perfect. Yes, it would. So if, if he can do that, that would be amazing. But I just feel like I don't know if it's in him. Yeah, we'd, I think, we'd have I, to I wait think that's why they picked him. But I don't know if that's what he can do. Yeah, yeah we'll we, have we to really see. have to wait and see. Um, he, I think he's about the right age now, isn't he? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I haven't seen him since the Karate Kid, really. I mean, I saw bits of of uh, After Earth, but I I knew not to watch it based on what I saw. Um, so if he can pull it off, that would be amazing. But DC has been making some real quest questionable casting decisions of late. Um, mm -hmm. replacing the CW Flash Arrows Deadshot with Will Smith was really high up on my questionable con questionable calls. Because I don't know him you had comics, a comic, so I couldn't really tell you how he... You had a character that owned the role, made it his own. Yeah, but remember, they, they, was, they're trying, they're trying to... Favorite, what? They're, they're trying to sell these as two separate universes, so they couldn't use the same yes, actor. Yes, I know. Anyway. Yeah, but then... Uh, doing it for for to an actor that has basically two modes and neither of them matches Deadshot that we know ah. um, is kind of like going and then taking a favorably reviewed Deadshot away from us because they don't want to have two Deadshots on, on screens at the same time was kind of like really DC either allow to yeah, sorry Either allow two actors to play the roles in the different universe continuities or make it one collective universe. One or the other, not both. I, I, I agree with that. Yeah, definitely. I mean, they that's something they do a lot. They're like, oh, we're, we can't have our two distinct universes and treat them as two distinct universes because we'll confuse the audience. Well, whose fault is that? It's entirely, you know, it's entirely your fault for doing that in the first place if you really think the audience can't understand it. I think I think uh, I feel like they did the same thing with something else a few years back. I don't remember if it was something X Men related or something or something completely was different. It, are you but thinking of Nick Fury? I don't think like, so. Honestly, I don't. Yeah. I know they That's did swap on Nick Fury anyway. in the comics, but yeah, I'm just trying to remember. Like I'm, I, I just remember something happened with uh, to the point where one of the one, something as a result as a result of a comic movie they changed something because they were afraid it would confuse people. But I don't remember if it was Marvel or DC. Mm. Yeah. Well, because um, like I remember Marvel, it was people. Yeah. Marvel. Go ahead, Aaron. Go ahead. Because I remember you guys uh, were talking about uh, how Nick Fury had been swapped out from uh, from the original Caucasian character to the uh to mimic samuel l jackson because samuel l jackson wanted to play the character so they were I, kind of courting him i don't think that was because of the movie though the, the ultimate nick fury had already been based off samuel l jackson and that was well, this, and then they we're talking about original they, universe they, 616. they already had they already had the movies in mind mm. when they were when they built the ultimate universe so they uh, they already had knew that they wanted him in the movie, so they made the character look like him, so that they could so that they could convince him to get him, and then later on they replaced the six sixteen version with his son. Not that it's going to matter anymore, because of course the Marvel universe is currently getting destroyed. Again? Or did I not did I not tell you guys about this? Oh yeah, that, that's what they're doing with Secret Wars right now. Yeah. 
Yes, again. it is. It is, there, again? it is the Marvel version of Crisis well, actually, on Infinite I, Earths. I thought they recently destroyed both 616 and Ultimate in that series. Yes, they or, did. Yeah. 616, Ultimate, and say. a whole bunch of other... Well, he said it's being destroyed. Mutants. I thought they already were destroyed. Well, technically, they're doing the beginning of Secret Wars now. The uh, All the major Marvel lines are doing their final days stuff while wow. the Secret Wars stuff is going on. Um, when it's going out, there is going to be one universe with the with characters combined from both and from other various Marvel Comics universes, including the 90s X-Men cartoon universe. Huh? Yes. The the '90s X Men are getting thrown into the into the mix on War World. Hmm. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of hoping. Ba- yeah, there. Are, I'm, I'm kind of hoping from, that. Th- go ahead, Bill. One at a time. Well, that's why I stopped when he continued. And then you said go ahead, and then you continued. I never said go ahead. <sighs> I just stopped. Bill, go. go. Ahead. Now, no one's talking. But uh, yeah. From, I guess from what I understand, they're try- they're uh, essentially doing a lot with Secret Wars to imitate what they were doing with uh, I'm forgetting the name of it now, but the Spider-Man event that they did, which involved every single on-screen version of Spider-Man being crossing over with one another, another in comics plus uh, other the Spider of Multiverse, whatever it was called, yeah, yeah. The Spider-Verse, Spider-Verse. That, that sounds about right. But even the Spider Verse, or even all the Spider characters, are are getting thrown into this too. But I was kind of hoping Spider with that the the nineties X Men cartoon uh, carrot ones are the ones that actually live through to the next universe because that cuts so much bullshit out of the X Men stuff. Yay! Because that's basically rebooting them back to the Jim Lee era, which would be kind of cool. Which is where they were last really, really good, to be honest. Yeah, I think that's that might be what they have planned. Like, anyway, was the last time X Men were really, really good. Nineties, they were. The, the, by the awesome. way, Let's with that with whole thing, the MCU is not being affected. So, since we're at the end of the news, and I just saw this, apparently it is Zachary Quinto, aka Siler, and the new Spock, uh, thirty-eight birthday today. So huh. we missed that earlier on, but Spock. we got it live, live before the end of the news. Zach. Yeah. He's live older than prosper. me. He doesn't look that old. He looks like he's in his mid twenties. No, I'm pretty sure right? he's in his thirties. Thirty-eight today, yeah. Yeah. So he looks like he'd be like twenty-five in the. Yeah. That's that's what makeup and lights will do to you. Yep. So that so that's what a Mo Howard haircut will do to you. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Bonk. I I poke. All right. So I guess we should move on to the news to our summary. I can do that. Oh, I, I did send uh, in our uh, Skype chat a uh, a countdown timer. I figured that would add drama to our uh, five minute challenge. <laughs> we can we can okay. we can put it up big on this on the stream. Uh. Uh. What? In the in the Skype chat, the le- the link I just sent, oh. you can use it as a timer when we do our five minute summary challenges on okay. screen. Okay, I have it ready. All right. So I first of all, of course, I will open the five minute minute challenge to all all of you. Is there any takers for this particular uh, for this particular series? I'm has, trying to get to work. Has Aaron <laughs> taken it yet? No, no but... I don't want to do it. No. No. No, wow, no, that was a that was a Peter no. Griffith no. No. <laughs> uh-uh. Wow. So five minutes, okay. So five zero zero. Don't start it yet, because nobody is. That's... Are there any takers? Oh, I believe I did last time. So. Yep. I know anybody going going. All right, I guess it's going to be up to me. Are you Mark? Are All right, ready? yep, go. Mm-hmm. Hey, Mark, get set, go. Okay, so the Doctor and Sarah Jane Smith are on their way to vacation on the planet F- Florana when the TARDIS suddenly starts running out of power. 
they try various things to keep power to the TARDIS, and it just keeps draining, and they wind up landing on a planet. Even their electric torch starts running out of power, and the doctor is forced to resort to uh, an oil lamp. Walking outside into a fog, Sarah needs to go back and change into some warmer clothes. The doctor promises that he won't leave her, and as soon as she goes back into the TARDIS, he goes off and leaves her. Sarah changes clothes, and while they're in there, somebody else apparently goes into the TARDIS, touches Sarah, and she freaks out and flees. Running across the field, she comes across the city with a weird glowing beacon on top. After touching a couple of glowing uh, walls on the city, she's captured by a bunch of people with, in weird cloaks who are the natives, the Exelons. The Doctor, meanwhile, has found an Earth party, Space Marines, who are on the planet to mine a rare material to help cure a space plague ravaging the outer worlds. While he's talking to them in their ship, another ship lands, and the, the crew gleefully runs out to uh, see what they think is their relief ship, leaving their commander wounded in the ship. The Exelons, of course, sneak into the ship and, cap and kidnap him. The ship that lands is not the relief ship they thought, but it is instead commanded by Daleks whose first instinct are to shoot the group. They fail because their guns use power and they don't have any. The Daleks, the humans, and the Doctor are soon beset on by the Exelons and a brief battle ensues in which a Dalek is destroyed. The humans keep trying to resist, but when the Exelons bring out their commander, they're forced to surrender. The Exelons drag the Doctor back to their cavern where they discover a ritual sacrifice involving Sarah Jane is already in place. She had touched their sacred city and now must die. The doctor, of course, doesn't like this and intervenes. And as a and after a struggle ensues, he's uh, locked away with Sarah Jane. Uh, only to have, of course, the sacrifice uh, take again, this time for two. Meanwhile, the Daleks have cut a deal with the Exelons knowing that, the, that some of the Daleks back on their ship are formatting new weapons based on actual bullets. These work, so the Daleks quickly uh, decide to lay siege to the Exelons and take control. This forcefully happens during the Doctor and Sarah's sacrifice, and the Doctor and Sarah escape down the tunnel, which they were going to be sacrificed to. Not brilliant move number two. The Daleks quickly take the humans and Exelons and convert them into a slave work party to mine the rare minimal, or mineral. The Doctor and Sarah wander down this tunnel and come across a probe from the city, I guess you could call it, a vine whip-like thing with a head on it, which uh, is very rather hostile. Daleks pursuing the Doctor and Sarah come down. They're briefly separated when Sarah comes across a couple of apparently rogue Exelons. Um, the Dalek encounters the whip, and the whip wins. Um, Doctor and Sarah are reunited, and Sarah introduces, her, or introduces him to her shining friends, and they are Exelons that hate the city. The Doctor realizes the city must be the source of the power drain, especially the beacon on top, and decides to go to the city to shut it down. He sends Sarah back to the humans to tell them to mine or to get the uh, mineral onto their ship as soon as it takes, as soon as it's ready to go. Um, the doctor infil infiltrates the city uh, through a series of intelligence tests with Daleks in close pursuit. Uh, various tests are done. A one of these patterns are not like the others. A maze, a exploding uh, floor, a mind control, and eventually a sanity assault. And eventually the doctor finds the control room, which the controllers had long since turned to dust, the last of which does so as they enter. The doctor then decides to quickly reprogram the computer, um, which causes some antibodies to be created to stop the doctor. Uh, they attack the doctor just as he finishes, and the Daleks wind up interfering and the antibodies go after them, leaving the doctor and his excellent companion a uh, chance to escape the city. Meanwhile, the humans had planted bombs on the top of the, the, the beacon, Sarah having convinced them to escape, and winds up blowing up the beacon, which ends the power drain. Um, they manage to... Uh, uh -oh. You know... Yeah, that's why the countdown timer is not a good idea. Um... <laughs> 
<laughs> Were you watching it the whole time? No, I was trying to finish. <laughs> oh. But getting interrupted like that is generally not how it's done. I tell you the final time once you're done. <laughs> Uh, kind of it'll like, only go to the time that it expires. You, I think last time you told Matt at zero at zero seconds. No, I or don't. Five minutes, depending on how you want to say. I it. wasn't. I wasn't able to do this last week because my mic was out. Somebody else did a. Uh, or la last, like and... last time that you had timed and Matt had done it. I thought. Nope. Maybe not. Nice. I wait till okay. I wait till I wait till the summary's finished, gotcha. and then say you did it in, oh. and give the time. Maybe it was <laughs> maybe. Um, anyway, okay, maybe it was Aaron timing last week. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Anyway. Sorry. Yeah, because now we're taking a whole extra minute that we didn't need to take. <laughs> Me. Anyway, so with the with the uh, power destroyed, the power comes back onto the ships. Um, the humans have gotten the Peridium smuggled onto their ship, and they manage to take off. The Daleks plan on taking off and dropping a bomb on the planet, uh, a plague bomb. But one of the humans had snuck onto the Dalek ship with one of the bombs, blew himself up and, and the Daleks with him, sacrificing themselves. Meanwhile, the city itself starts to crumble and dissolve to dust. Uh, the Doctor laments that now there are only 699 wonders in the universe, and that's the end of the serial. See, that could have been about 5 minutes 30 seconds. <laughs> we threw you off your game, huh? Yeah, the, the large annoying buzzer <laughs> sound I actually jumped, so... I think the buzzer sound was Matt's voice, actually. Yes, it was. I think that, yeah. <laughs> well, sorry, but the thing also sounded really loud on my end, too, so it would have interrupted anybody anyway. To, to be fair, I didn't know that it was going to do that, or I probably would have told Matt to mute it. Yeah, I, what, what, I, you actually, what, what, what we actually need is a stopwatch app. Yeah, we don't... Well, this is supposedly a stopwatch, but well, it's not actually point, a stopwatch. It's a timer. Zero, but apparently you have to mute it to do that. Well, no, a stopwatch the, will start the, 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 zero. no, this is not a stopwatch. The, the, the particular app that that you pointed us to is a countdown clock, and what that's, we need is an actual that's, elapsed that's, clock. That's my point. A, a stopwatch would count at zero, whereas we're doing a five-minute challenge. So I figured start something that starts at five minutes. Yeah, except you don't want to interrupt. You just want time elapsed. That that same site does have other stopwatch related apps though. See, all we need are obstacle courses and a gong. <clears throat> yeah, For but that would be a podcast in itself. <laughs> we don't want to have to opt for the physical challenge. This is not double dare. <laughs> okay, they do have a stopwatch on here, okay. Yeah. That would be that would be a better choice so that when when you basically somebody, the person running the stop dodge clicks and goes and go at the same time. Person does the summary and finishes with and stop. Person running the stopwatch stops it gives the elapsed time. How does that sound? Sounds like top gear. Hey, Top Gear! Hey, Top Gear is a new is a nice basis, considering the fact that probably new Top Gear isn't going to be halfway as cool. <laughs> they are doing new Top Gear. Oh uh, yeah, um, all three of the all three of the uh, the Top Gear hosts have officially Left. quit, as has the director. But the BBC has sworn that they will continue to make a new season of Top Gear. So, unless I guess but, some guys that are really good, it's kind of suck. Yeah. Anyway, that was the summary. So now we're going to move on to our uh, our likes and dislikes. And uh, I wish I could say it was it's vindictive for buzzing me, but um, yeah. <laughs> you see, you always start anyway. I always start us off anyways. Nothing new there. So uh, things I liked about this one, um. I one of the, one of the new things that I liked in general that they added in was we've known the Daleks to be trying to always conjure up master plans, and this one is no different than normal. But we get to see how smart they really are by actually trying to work their way around a problem like not being able to use energy in a regular basis. So they actually have to come up with new weapons in order to make themselves the usual threat that they are. <laughs> 
which I thought was an interesting little sign of how, how, how much of an intelligent threat the dogs can be when they want to be. All right. Bill, how about you? I had trouble picking good and bad things about this. I'm not sure if my mind just wasn't on it or what. I tend to have more semi-neutral observations uh, but at least this was an entertaining thing, so I'm going to count it as a good thing. Mm -hmm. And that was, the Daleks are really excitable in this episode. Uh -huh. And it's just, I don't know, entertaining watching them as they're, you know, the the, the high-pitched voice one is, like, panicking. Actually, I think there are a couple high-pitched voice ones. But the yeah, one that... they seem to have a little more range on this one. Yeah. Which is a good thing, because the Daleks are completely and... emotionless. Yeah. It's their uh, Prozac. They're panicking and exploding and killing themselves for failure, and it does make them more entertaining to watch, which uh, ca causes us to stand out a bit. Mm -hmm. mm. All right. Uh, I should probably do Tim's while we're on me, right? Sure. Like mm. he did last week. Might as well. Tim, Tim mentioned that his favorite thing in general was the sound. He found the sound effects and the sound mixing to be very immersive. Especially like hmm. the ominous chanting and the way some of the voices echoed, it was almost oh. like a radio drama at some points. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's actually the chanting is the one thing I remember most about the serial. I should comment, I used to own this on DVD that I had bought from uh, the video station's overstock bin back in the 80s. So I have watched this particular episode a few thousand times. Since, you know, one of the things I would do in the 80s when I was idling and had nothing else to do, I'd throw in Doctor Who. Did it in the 90s, too. So, yeah, that particular echo. Hoi hoo ya! Hoi hoo ya! Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, it sticks in your mind. So, Aaron, what did you like in general about this serial? Um, although their costumes, I, I found were kind of, sort of, a little bit goofy, um, I like the Exelons, um, their societies. The two different societies, and the fact that there actually were two different societies, um, one established to worship the city, and the other ones were, uh, they didn't worship the city, they still feared it as kind of a dangerous area, as a dangerous thing. Um, but they weren't, like, so fearful that they were, like, worshipping it and everything like that. Um, yeah, I, I thought that was pretty cool. It kind of gave them a little bit more dimension as characters themselves. Um, Rand, you said, uh, you mentioned that the one Exelon who escorts, or goes with the doctor through the city, um, yeah, it's, I just thought it was pretty neat. Yeah, the fact that he's, you know, he's actively afraid of the city. He would mm -hmm. rather face the Daleks than face the city. But mm -hmm. he does it anyway because he knows it has to be done. So, yep. yeah, that was... I thought it was pretty cool. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and then just, you know, them them slowly becoming enslaved by the by the Daleks and everything. They, they let their... The, the, the ones that uh, are worshipping the city, they kind of let their fear, their fear rule them and they wind up be literally becoming a slave to their fear as they work for the Daleks and the humans. In the little mining pits or whatever that yeah. that they managed to make. Mm -hmm. Alright, so in general, what I liked about this episode was the pacing. There's not really a slow moment in this episode. Not really, no. And this, it just, this is the it, second four-part four Dalek story. Mm-hmm. And the, the first one that's actually intended to feature Daleks. Actually, mm -hmm. no, this one was not intended to feature Daleks. Really? Yes. Mm -hmm. ah. um, Terry, Terry Nation wrote this episode, but he wrote this episode to not, be, to not be a Dalek episode. He wrote the city, he wrote the Exelons, um, and then um, Terrence Dix and Robert Holmes... Uh, basically said, well, if we have Terry Nation writing an episode, it has to have Daleks in it. And sent it back to Terry and said, add some Daleks. And Terry actually added the Daleks, and I think it actually made the serial better this time. Yes. Because yes. Um, probably the original Terry Nation script 
um, basically all those scenes um, where the they were pursued by Daleks, etc., were probably just them standing around and not really being hasty. Right. Okay. So that explains why there are the two different plots going on. Yeah. Dealing with the that Daleks, that, 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 dealing with the city. Yep. That means the rewrite added the second plot. And I yeah, think there, there the wasn't enough without had, the Daleks for four episodes. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I I think uh, adding that second plot added a uh, added a um, a level to the to the serial that made it better. Not to mention the and fact it that it wasn't originally pacing. Dalek story made it a little bit of a breath fresh uh, breath of fresh air because normally when he, Terry goes in there planning to do Daleks, it's very samey. Yep. It probably ended with the Doctor having a brawl with a mindless slave of the machine. <laughs> or something to that effect. Quite possibly. Anyway. <laughs> um, I actually, it probably just was he rewired it and then had to escape quickly while the doors, you know, opened and closed and shit. I, I was, I was but, basically making a subtle Star Trek reference. Yes, I know. Captain Kirk does all the time. Well, basically, what he did to the machine is what Captain Kirk does all the time. Only he did it, yeah. you know, by rewiring it. Still, giving it a few unsolvable problems. Could have worse. The city could have responded by uh, beaming the doctor into itself, or he was forced to fight for his life. Tron, come yeah. on, people. <laughs> all right. So, what didn't you like, Matt? Ah, uh, what didn't I like? Um, I'm trying to think of anything I really didn't care for in this one. It's going to be a nitpick. Um, I think, um... If you don't have anything, you can pass. I think the one thing I will point out is that, uh, um, I think that at one point during the last episode in particular, they were kind of making it look like there might have been someone actually working behind the scenes in the city, and it was just a red herring. I, I would have preferred that if they would have actually just not had that silhouette guy there at all, or if it, he actually did something before getting rid of him. You mean the, the guy at the controls? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That they dissolves to dust when they get there. That I actually mentioned um, that that the cliffhanger from three to four was not supposed to be the cliffhanger, but timing that was the only thing they could find that was closest to a cliffhanger. Hmm. There were two things that could have been great cliffhangers before and after. Before you have where the doctors futzing outside the the city walls looking for a way in. Yeah, and you see the Daleks coming in. That would have been a good cliffhanger, and that was the one they wanted to, but that would have made episode three too short. The next one they could have done is where you have the doctor going, and they cut back, and you see what looks to be somebody looking at them. That would have been a good cliffhanger. Mm -hmm. Even if it turns out the guy just dissolved, it would have been for, made for a good cliffhanger, but they didn't use either one. Anyway. So it just kind of came off as rather meh. Bill. What didn't you like? I'm going to say the subplot with dealing with the city, and that's mainly because it didn't draw my attention as much as everything with the Daleks. And it might just be that the Daleks distracted from it by being better. But I just, every time they were dealing with, you know, the subplots and such, I was just like, okay, let's get back to the Daleks. Okay. And uh, Tim's? Tim's was, uh, he mentions that the Doctor and Sarah Jane could be a little defeatist at times, which was kind of a downer, uh, such as when the Doctor bemoans the loss of the city despite having stopped a space plague, or the exchange where the Doctor says we can't leave until we find the source of the interference, and Sarah Jane says you mean we're trapped here forever. There were actually a few lines in between there, but I'm not going to interrupt his point. Yeah. Uh, the doctor made it clear that they weren't trapped there forever, and Sarah Jane was being needlessly pessimistic. He believes that pessimism is never called for. I kind of get it, although, I, to be fair, during that scene, they had no idea what was causing the interference or if they ever could defeat it. So there was cause yeah. to, you know, wonder if they were trapped forever. Yeah, if he, doesn't like, if, if he doesn't like pessimism, he waits till he sees the sixth doctor in Vengeance on Veros. 
<laughs> where he's basically mooning in the TARDIS because it's run out of power in the hmm. middle of the void. Well, a lot of Doctor Who episodes start with, we have no idea if we're trapped here forever or not. Let's do. Let's mm -hmm. take a look. And, of course, it's partially to sell the crisis to the audience. Yeah. But the Sixth Doctor, in that particular bit, takes it to new things. Perry's trying to do her best to try to cheer him up and get him to think of something. She, at one point, finds the TARDIS manual and hands it to him. It's like, oh, yeah, I remember looking through this once, and throws it on the ground. Because, of course, he's the sixth doctor and he's fucking melodramatic. Anyway. So, Aaron, what's your least favorite thing? Um, I actually didn't like the costumes for some of the Exelons. The full body costumes seem to work pretty well. But the, um, the, the more religious types, the ones that were worshipping the city... I could clearly see, uh, especially the ones in the backgrounds, if you looked around the neck area, it looked like the masks were almost completely lifted out of the clothing and were sticking up, and you could see the edges and everything like that, so... Oh, so like I'm the neck collars sure were coming that. out of the robes? Yeah. Yeah, the, they, they were pretty bad, and they were, you could see, they kept them mostly in the background, but there were occasionally scenes that where they would be in the foreground, and you would clearly see that there was some kind of foobar going on. Yeah, it's so. one thing when it's actually skin over skin, but when the skin is flapping over that, like that over your clothes, there's something odd mm -hmm. going on here. Yeah. So, all right. that, that was all right. Yeah, alright, mine's on a related... Stint, uh, my least favorite thing in the serial is the Daleks. And by the Daleks, I mean the models. Um, as we know, they had gotten a whole bunch of new models for the previous serial, Planet of the Daleks. The problem was, um, apparently the contractor they had used for those models gave them substandard models. And they had already started to deteriorate pretty badly... Um, by the time the serial came around, and I believe this was only a year later. Yeah. Um, so they were forced to scrape up old Dalek models from the 60s. And I mean, when I mean models from the 60s, I mean from like the first couple serials. And then they had to redress them to make them look like modern Daleks, and they did a piss poor job of it. You can literally see where that middle section of the Dalek was painted with a, a, single, a, a single pass paint job. And then they, the little um, rectangly bits were put on uneven and the skirt thing was uneven. It looked like a really haphazard job, possibly because they had to do it at the last minute. Probably. But it kept distracting me as they'd show a close-up of this Dalek with the skirt slaunch wise on it, and I'm like, God, that looks bad. And, of course, they, then they had to replace the domes with the, the wooden reserve domes that they used from the last season's models, too. <clears throat> so, yeah, a lot of weirdness went on. Which also explains why they caught on fire so easy. Yes. Yeah, probably why they were destroying so many. Yeah, they were actually probably destroying a lot of the wooden knockoffs from the previous serial. The the the, the mock-ups that they were using in the back, mm -hmm. the back for the stationary ones, they just uh, put that and have somebody uh, blow one of those up and smash them in. That gave them Daleks that they were able to smash. But still, the fact that you know they could have at least taken the extra day to paint them right. And, you know, actually used, like, uh, a level when putting on the, the, the bits would have been nice. That's BBC okay. last minute budget for you. Yeah, I know. Doctor Who hasn't had the greatest budget ever. Well, currently it does, but that's because it's the frickin' flagship of the BBC. Anyway, so, favorite scene. Matt. Oh, favorite scene. Um, oh, I'm trying to just handpick one. Um, 
I guess a kind of heartfelt moment that I, I kind of noticed, even though it was a little bit of a downer note, slightly, uh, was where uh, the doctor is talking with Sarah Jane before he heads to the city. And he's like, well, if anything goes wrong, you're going with the humans, got it? You just don't question. They just kind of look at each other for a moment, and she's like, okay. Because, because I think even the doctor knew that if if something goes really wrong and he can't make it back, at the very least she could try to get some sort of resemblance of what her life used to be if she went back to Earth even in the future. Okay. Yeah, well, you know, a few just, companions have had to deal with stuff like that. Yeah, it, but it, it feels like a rather genuine moment, and uh, Elizabeth Slayton uh, kind of start is, is already kind of shining through, even though this is, I think, her first half season. Yes, this is this is the third serial that she was in. Mm-hmm. Because uh, she started in the Time Warrior at the beginning of the season, and then she had the abysmal invasion of the dinosaurs, <laughs> which was the serial right before this. <clears throat> anyway, yeah, yeah but she, it's it's also just a call for Liz Sladd that she's a wonderful actress, or was. Was, yes. All right, <laughs> Bill, your least, or your favorite scene. I'm going to go on a similar track with I mentioned with the Daleks being entertaining. This is another a scene that cracked me up to the point where I actually had to re rewind back to make sure I saw it the right way. The, Dal the Dalek firing range with the model TARDIS target. The, the clay police box, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that, just, that just cracked me up. And, okay. Yeah, so there, that, I don't think you can really there. say anything more about that. Yeah. It's not it's not like a deep scene or anything you can talk a lot about, but it's one that cracked me up and I had to rewind to make sure I saw it the right way. The Daleks with goddess. their with their mock up TARDIS to Hate test out their goddess. new guns. <laughs> yeah, already seen uh, the Daleks deep seated hatred of the doctor. Yeah. Uh Tim's favorite scene has even less of a description because he used one word, which is hopscotch. Uh the scene where yeah, the doctor's talking it's, about it's, Venusian yeah. hopscotch. Looking at that, it's pretty much, you can understand where they got the concept for uh, the five doctors scene. A little bit, yeah. yes. Which makes me wonder if Rassilon visited the city when it was being built and said, hey, that's an idea. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Aaron, Only mine's what going is... to be more complicated. <laughs> All right, mm -hmm. so Aaron, uh, what's your favorite scene? I actually like uh, the scene. It's the one, the scene that I remember most from the VHS that we would rent from the library. Um, it's the one where the doctor first sees the city and starts admiring it as one of the seven hundred wonders of the of the uh, galaxy, or is it the universe? The universe. Of, yeah, and I'm like, well, what are the other six hundred ninety nine wonders? Yeah, it would have been great for to occasionally have an episode where it's like, ah, yes, another of the seven hundred wonders of the universe. Yeah, it would have been that would have been pretty neat. Yeah, it's I just I just thought it was kind of cool because I've always been interested in the seven wonders of our world here. So having learned about them a long time ago, so yeah, I just thought it was a nice little kind of tidbit. I wish they had pursued it. All right, and for my favorite scene, I'm going to go for a twofer. Two different scenes because we've got time, and I'm at I'm the last person here. One which I love the banter between the Doctor and Sarah um, in the TARDIS when the power first comes out. And they're trying desperately to keep their spirits high, and he pulls out the oil lamp, and she and Sarah's just like, let me guess, you're going to rub it in some of the No, I'm going to lighten it, light it and illumine us. And for some reason, that statement, just the way Pertwee puts it, has always cracked me up. It's a horrible pun, but Pertwee pulls it off. And another scene is uh, when they're under the city, or um, under the uh, Exelon's uh, encampment. Oh. And uh, the doctor ha had just faced off with the probe, and then the Daleks faced off with the probe. Sarah's with the renegade Exelons, and there somebody's coming, and you see the, the Dalek <laughs> gun stick, and it turns out to be Pertwee holding it. 
the thing is, when I see that scene, I can see Tom Baker doing it even better than Pertwee did. Because <laughs> he would be having that epic troll face that, that Tom Baker has. Mm-hmm. That wide grin when he'd be doing it. And it's obvious because this is the this is the team that fired off Tom Baker, so it's kind of obvious where they got that that sense of humor for him. Okay, your least favorite scene. Uh, I actually do have one. Um, at the near the end, when they're by the Dalek ship, they're watching uh, the two guys load up what is the uh, bags of sand. Uh huh. Uh, all of a sudden, they're spotted by Daleks, and then all of a sudden, everyone's together. And the guy, one guy is hiding, even though the other guy was dragged out already. I, I was so confused. I swear to God, I missed a scene or something. Yeah, it might have been a scene that was cut for time. Which they really shouldn't have, because that just made it really goddamn confusing. Mm. Hopefully they have it in one of the DVD edits or something, but just... I think it, I, I, wow. I think it was explained better in the novelization. Um, yeah, it just kind of blindsided me out of nowhere. Like, there's like two or... It feels like there's at least a scene, if not two, that were suddenly cut and everyone's together. It's like, what? All right. Um, Bill, your least favorite scene. Okay, and I actually... It looks like Tim and I chose this scene for the same scene for different reasons. And it's the scene where the doctor is essentially having, he's essentially resisting having uh, his brain or being driven mad by the, uh, by the city, I guess. At least I think it's the city, uh-huh. wh- whoever's, whoever's mm-hmm. doing it. And for me, it, I just say because, like, it seemed there's nothing actually happening on screen other than some really dated 70s colors and it just it, i don't know it just feels too dated Warning, for the me. following scene is not to be watched by people with epileptic tendencies yeah and that goes into tim's complaint about the scene was me he says mainly because it hurt his eyes well a little not quite the same as epilepsy but still something like those lines almost yeah yeah all right Actually, I kind of like that scene, but mostly because it's what Pertwee is saying while all that's going on. Even though it's and a bit he, garbled. Yep. Yeah. So, Aaron, your least favorite scene. My least favorite scene is a scene that was not seen. Um, it's the one where the doctor goes through and he traces his finger over the, uh, the maze and uh, manages to get into the next room along with the... I can't remember. The Exxon that was with him actually did have a name. It was like Ro or Rao oh, or something. Yeah, or Rao. Rao. Yeah, there, it Rao. was a little yeah. more than that. Yeah, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so... Uh, and then we Bilal, see the Daleks... Yeah. yeah. Then we see the Daleks follow behind him. And I want to know how the Daleks managed to trace <laughs> their suckers over the... Uh, I was <laughs> actually wondering that while watching, to too. To it's, they don't show it. They just they they cut away from that, and then they show the Daleks move through that wall, as if they have a little bit later, to yeah. Open it. So, and it's just like, wait a second, how did that work? They don't have fingers. I mean, they have the little I gun use the thing edge that they of can my try, suction but... cup. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's 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 just like how the Daleks were unable to open the. Uh, I forget what the prison was called in Doomsday because they didn't have hands. How'd they get through this? <laughs> uh huh. So that's just my thing. Well, my I am also not liking the same scene, but for a different reason. Um, that room that had the maze in it uh, had the most collection of dead people in it because they couldn't progress to the next part of the maze. If you look at the maze itself. That's a maze that would appear on the back cover of Highlights for Children. Yeah. Recommended age, seven. <laughs> oh, yeah. Matter of fact, use is... an image of it. So, Want to send it to the sky? Oh, you did? Or did you? It, oh, no. It's, it's did on you send the, it to the sky stream. Chat? 
Actually, if you want to, I can... Thank you. It's literally ah, yes. um, it, it is it is literally a fairly simple maze, and this is yeah. after doing um, one of the th one of these things is not like the others with the outside, um, <laughs> which is actually far more complex than the highlights for for children maze. Well, this is a children's show. Yes, I know, but you know, a, a it children's kind of show felt that includes. The suicide bomber at the end. It, 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 you know, you feel like Actually, the, the one that bombers. killed the most Exelons probably should have been one of the later traps. True. That, that's, that was my main concern with it, is I'm looking at this maze, and I pretty much solved the maze while looking at it. Yeah. So I was like, yeah, I think uh, we need to... Uh, I think we need to take this maze back for a rewrite or a redraw. Maybe. Maybe. Yep. Maybe something a little more complicated, like something that isn't on the back of a napkin. Yeah, exactly. So, that is the end of our... Uh, favorites, least favorites, etc. Uh, we have time for some discussion here. Um, a wee bit of time, yes. Someone at the Metro wants them to bring back River Song. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe that's not the right discussion. Oh, I think I saw that. Well, uh, one, one scene that was uh, I want to give an honorable mention that I was almost almost going to include was the, the Dalek that was so upset that it, it failed that it blew up. <laughs> it, 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 it's, it's not even that it blew up I because failed. it was stressed I out. Failed. It literally said self destruct. Yes, it literally said self destruct. <laughs> well, it was kind of a lame self destruct because the explosion wasn't big enough to kill anybody other than the Dalek inside. I don't know if it had it. Oh, probe maybe it needed was power. A, the, it's possible. Anyway, that the probe was a very nice bit of. Uh, um, oh, yeah. Of I, I don't know if you'd call it costuming or propage, I guess. Propage. Because it looked very it, it looked very, very nice, especially mm. for the era. And that, it kind of reminded me a little bit of the Cybermats that would appear later on in Revenge of the Cybermen. Mm-hmm. Next season, I believe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This season or two, yeah. So kind of a nice consistency in design anyway. Yeah, those things were pretty lively, and they were an interesting lo enough looking creature, especially when they could uh, randomly pop out of the ground if they were yeah, too I close to the city. I really liked uh, <clears throat> the the scene where they had it in the in the water, and it looks like it's a freaking mile long tentacle. It, it looks huge. By the way, speaking of tentacles, what's with the third Doctor and tentacles? That is true. Spearhead from space, right? So you're from space, and then he got attacked by tentacles at least once a year <laughs> since then. It, it might well, be the writers. Was... I mean, I know uh, there was at least one writer that really loved writing uh, reptiles into stories. There was probably one that really liked writing tentacles. He was tentacle -like the star creatures. of the Doctor Who anime. <clears throat> <laughs> I don't know if I want to see that. Damn it, It'll Aaron. go to dark places, <laughs> Aaron. Dang I did it. not need to go there. <laughs> Picture it. I am oh. not going to. <laughs> that, that combined with the fact that the story editor for the for the third Doctor was Terrence Dix, and you can make puns with that. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Terrence. Oh God. <laughs> oh dear Terrence, I think we found one of your deepest darkest secrets. <laughs> That he is actually Lord Naughtius. <laughs> uh, God. Wow. So, so Terrence, how long is it? The, the three people that we had that might have been paying attention to this podcast. <laughs> Bye, viewers. Or getting them to draw said items. Oh, great. We've now uh, officially got slash fiction and hentai uh, coming. 
a, a few other things that I noticed in this. This could not. There's no way this could have been intentional unless the writer, unless the writers were time traveling themselves. But the first episodes, I felt like I was watching them uh, sh- scrambling around on Tatooine and encountering sand people. Mm-hmm. Although Sir Alec Guinness was not there yet to teach the Doctor how to do a crate dragon call. And then <laughs> in I think uh, episode three, a Dalek pulls a Darth Vader with "I am altering the deal." <laughs> um, even 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 before that, I was actually making a Star Wars parallel. Bill, you realize that the Exelons are essentially Ewoks. I was I was seeing them more as Sand People in in Episode One when they were fighting the Doctor. Yeah, but at the same time when they start they fighting, they dress like Ewoks. I, I did notice later on that they were dressed like Ewoks. Yeah, they're basically ugly Ewoks that overcome the technological marvel that is the Daleks. Right, true, I, true. Where you have that Dalek in episode two, as it just as they spear and arrow it to blow it to, into blowing up. Yes, <laughs> and have their it's little like, Ewok powwow around it. Yeah, but it's and it's like it's like ten years before Lucas will do it. Guess what? Doctor <laughs> Who did it first. They call it dibs, Lucas. Dibs. Right, so there's there's a there's a reference to all three Star Wars movies, and this is what nineteen seventy four. Four. Uh, yeah, this is, this would be Pertwee's final year. So yeah. 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 That's seventy three, seventy four. Yeah. Yeah. So it's ten years before Jedi. Still early enough that uh, a hey, new hope Lucas, is probably BBC not is going to sue. <laughs> now, yep. if, and now, if only the humans missed. Well, they didn't have weapons that they could use, but if they missed everything that they shot. <laughs> you know, <it's> so... <laughs> okay, here's here's an interesting piece of trivia for you. The insignia you could see on the uh, sp- the human expeditions uniforms, the Space Marine insignia. Terry Nation would eventually take that insignia, flip it around 180 degrees, and it would become the logo for Blake 7. Oh. Actually, I mean, not, not, not to take away from your Blake 7 thing, but I just realized uh, this is something that I noticed earlier. Since we're talking Star Wars, the Doctor pretty much confirms that the Daleks are Sith here. First he mentions that they're a living lump of hate, and then they're essentially using uh, telekinesis to move around. Psychokinetic power is what he said. Yeah. So he's basically Which, saying, you know, that I they thought they were powered the... by static. Yes, static yeah, electricity. Well, electricity and hate, and don't tell them otherwise. Point, apparently, at this point, they travel using the dark side of the force. <laughs> so, actually, I, they they actually it's not dark side of the force. They travel around using Bison's power. <laughs> Street Fighter. And Bison. Yeah. <laughs> Send bullet trains to Osaka. That's what that power is supposed to be that he has when he sails across. That's a huge psychokinetic force. So, yeah. I just think they have solar panels that are constantly working, so... Pfft, whatever. Yeah, except for the fact that that would be though, that would be drained before it got that to the dollar power. drive. Yeah. yeah. Except that they're constantly gaining power, though. So they wouldn't really notice. <laughs> in, either way, the whole point was that the, I think, at least as far as I got this, the whole point was that the city was zapping power from everything. Yep. So if they were using any sort of elect- electric power, it would be taken. I, I do love the fact that the Exelons, by the way, tended to have a East Surrey accent. Give it up! <laughs> That was the whole thing. They held a guy and they say it like that, and it's like, wow, really? You sound like a street gang. A bunch of hoodies. Yay. I mean, they, they couldn't have him do a rasp or anything. It's pretty much just straight, give it up. I'm like, wow. Next, they're going to grab him and go, you're nicked. It just seemed it, it just it just the, the, that particular voice seemed particularly odd to me. Uh, by the way, I'm looking at this image here, and actually the foreground Dalek with the uh, chest panels isn't too bad. 
but the one in the background, oh my god. You're, you're talking about the, the model itself? The, the, the little extra white panel things, like right above where their arms are. Mm-hmm. Just so cockeyed, how could you mess it up that bad? Like I said, I'm pretty sure those were original 63 models, or 64 models. The but ones the, before they had the panels. Yeah. Well, that the thing is, is that the one in the off. foreground actually looks like they paid attention to him, and he looks all right. But the one in the background just looks absolutely terrible. Yes, I know. Looks um, more rickety than a 60-year-old doc. If you have that picture, can you post that picture in the... In the chat, sure. Yep. Do, 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 do. V... The one again, the one in the, in the foreground, right behind the doctor, doesn't look too bad, but the one far back, ugh. Yeah, you you guys can actually see what I'm talking about when I made a complaint here. Mm hmm. My OCD is just making me twitch. Yeah, if you take a look at the at those panels on that one, you can see that they weren't even spaced right. All right. Weren't space um, right? They weren't even put I, in a I, straight I feel like line. There was one. I think there was one in. Uh, I think it was yeah. It was the previous story because it was the one that was standing uh, next to the gold Dalek that had the same issue. So this one's real. There, noticeable, was, there were some that do just look subpar. Yeah. You know? So one thing you notice that all the Daleks that are made for the current show are anal retentive to detail. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Which I'm thankful for. And there was and a Dalek and, and in they, the serial. And if they screw up, the uh, post team will get it. There, there was a Dalek in there that was even worse than that because that skirt that's below the uh, the arm units was lopsided. Oy. So right, right before where it comes down into the main skirt, that that belt kind mm -hmm. of thing was cursed launch wise on the model. And it just looked so badly done. It might actually be that that Dalek there, because you'll notice it, it's fairly close to the where the sucker arm comes out on the for, foreground one, but the background you can see a big gap there. So it might be the same one, but I'm thinking it was even worse on the one I'm I was looking at. Then I the Dalek model that they kept beating up the entire episode, and then I had to keep forcing on new parts. And each time it looked just as bad as the last. Yeah. That is possible. Because I, I know it, it looked like it on the one that got destroyed by the probe um, on the quarry hill. Had that issue. Yeah, they could have at least waited to put the junk one up there until it was time to get destroyed, but... They had too many far away shots of it looking good, <laughs> with good looks at it, and it's just like, oh. All right. So, do we have anything else we want to mention with this? Not really. Um, trying to think, was there any other little notes? In a way, I am a little sad for Terry Nation because I think he was trying to break out of being just the Dalek guy for Doctor Who. Yeah. And wanting to prove that, like, you know, Terrence Dix and anyone else, he could do any serial. And they said, no, do more Daleks. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that made him sad. You notice, though, he at least got to write in a little bit of the Doctor using his, his Kung Fu. <laughs> yeah. Just a little bit. Although that part, part of it, I'm kind mm -hmm. of wondering if... if uh, Nation had at this point been more expensive than other writers due to his, you know, success and such. Because at that point, you know, I, if, if I was dealing with, you know, if he was a more expensive writer and the first one with dibs on the Daleks, I would say, yeah, if we're paying your rates, it's a Dalek story. Um, as far as I'm I mean, aware, I, I don't not, know if that's a case or not, just speculation. I but. don't believe so, because Terry Nation, um... Yes, the Daleks had brought him to success, but then he dis he discovered the hard way that the Daleks outside of Doctor Who was pretty much a worthless commodity. True, I'm just thinking like the, the difficulties like with that Russell T. Davies had trying to get the rights to the Daleks and such. I just get the feeling that 
there's um, more the, money the, tied the, up in no, that. No, it wasn't money. Yeah. It was never about the money with that rights. The rights issue, um, the, the estate of Terry Nation had gotten pissed off recently. I mean, this was as of 2004, 2005 when they were making mm -hmm. the new series. At Warner Brothers. Um, because at Warner Brothers using Daleks without permission. So there were legally a bunch of hoops that they had to go through. And they, kept, they added a whole bunch of other hoops, etc. Um, that was just stalling talks and they didn't know if they'd get all, all those hurdles cleared by the time they needed to go to filming. And I think they literally did just weeks beforehand. So they literally had to go back and rewrite the script at the last minute. Which is, you know, great because some of those became really, really good episodes. And mm -hmm. you notice um, one of the things that the new series did is it made the Daleks a hell of a lot more badass. If you're looking at these early days on how little it actually took to kill a Dalek. Yeah. Yeah. Versus how hard it is to kill a Dalek. Look, look at this. Look at the the amount of Daleks that die in this, compared to the amount of to the amount of people the Dalek killed in Dalek, before they convinced it to kill itself. Yeah. Well, it's even like I mentioned yesterday, or not yesterday, but last week, with the uh, you know the doctor like manhandling the Dalek. You know that wouldn't fly in New Who. No. Yeah. I'm pretty yeah, sure they, someone didn't they mention that someone had burst into flame from touching the Dalek. Depends I the think Dalek. so. Yeah, yeah, that it was mentioned in narration. Yes. So yeah, it's the Daleks got a hell of an upgrade in this because you get the feeling in this the Time Lords, if they had flexed their muscles at this point, could have gone nye and kicked Dalek ass, you know. And, he, and in by the time things got around to it, in you know the time war and everything, the time the Do the time lords and the Daleks were fairly evenly matched, although the Daleks had I think numeric superiority. Mm hmm. Just a huge difference in power. The new who really gives the credit for making the Daleks scary again. Yeah. Okay, that's close enough, too, to go to final thoughts. Yep. So, Matt. Final thoughts. Um, I... This is, a, this is a pretty good episode, don't get me wrong, but the title is a little bit misleading, outside of the fact that we do get a few blown-up Daleks. Um, uh... We still don't have, like, the mass numbers like we used to have during the first Doctor. Um, at least not by the look of it. This is still, like, a small, like, I want to say six-group party. It's still going to be a while before we get the really huge numbers. We um, have yeah, we had thousands of Daleks die in, uh, in, the la in last week's episode, whereas this one, not as many. Yeah. Um, yeah, last time was, like, the last time we had a decent number, and most of them were action figures, so, meh. Um, but as the story goes, it does feel a bit stronger than the last couple, the last one was, and I think the last one before the, uh, um, I think the, I think this is a stronger one than the first, do uh, third Doctor episode. Because wasn't didn't he? Yeah, he had the one before, with uh, the time traveling agents in the loop. It was still a pretty good episode, but I think this one's a little bit better. This is finally a step up uh, again. So overall, above above the average, I would think, which is where you kind of hope a Dalek story would be. So that's about it. All right. Okay, well, this story uh, gets an opinion as being one of the bottom of the barrel Dalek stories, and I don't think it's you know watching it here. I didn't feel didn't definitely didn't feel it was quite that bad. Uh, he suffered worse. Yeah, there there have definitely been worse, and I can 
I mean, I can kind of see where some criticism comes from it, but ultimately just the fact that it wasn't as high profile as some of the others, and I think it was just, I think we were having some Terry Nation fatigue at this point, but mm -hmm. even then, it's it's not all that bad of an episode. Again, I did feel, you know, did feel there was quite a bit of entertaining bits, even if it wasn't technically great. Uh, not the scariest Daleks I've seen, and maybe that's where the title comes from because the Daleks are kind of kind of pushovers. But yeah, it's an it's an all right serial. Uh, Tim's final thoughts were that this was a well constructed story with some good ideas, some of which could have been executed better, but which he still enjoyed. Mm hmm. All right, Aaron. I really did enjoy this uh, story. Uh, it's probably just under um, Frontier in Space uh, for me. Mm -hmm. um, I liked it much better than Planet of the Daleks. Uh, it feels like a fresher concept, at least. Um, yeah, I, 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 I really did enjoy it. I like I liked the uh, idea of the humans being stranded, the two different groups of ex uh, of Exelons, the Daleks, and I really... I actually really enjoyed the idea of a living city uh, sending out tendrils throughout the uh, the area to uh, kind of terrorize the inhabitants a little bit. <laughs> All right. Um, this one usually um, doesn't get a lot of credit um, by the people that write, you know, review guides and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, I actually love this story. Uh, it was one I owned. I watched it. I actually think, uh, excluding Frontier in Space, which I will say is more of a master story than a Dalek story, um, this is probably the best Dalek story of the Third Doctor era. I like yeah. it better than Day. I like it better than Planet. And Planet is the one, by the way, that, that uh, a lot of the ratings say, oh, yeah, this is the best of the Third Doctor for Daleks. Bullshit. Right. It was kind of middle of the road. It was a lot of borrowed ideas. Obviously, these people did watch these episodes close enough together. <laughs> yeah, this one is a lot better. It has a better pacing. There's more to the story than your your bare bones, uh, hey, look, it's the Daleks or it's Invasion of Earth all over again. That's the interesting part, too, I didn't get to mention, was that usually the, the planet that we end up on with the Daleks has already been invaded. This one, we actually see them commit the invasion with only three or four Daleks. Mm hmm Actually, there were a little more than that, because there were three Daleks that came out. Well, but, the, I but mean, the three or four that were out were the ones that kind of enforced it. And then there were the two that sat back and, and built the new guns. Mm hmm Yeah. So they had that. So they actually had intelligence plans, a reserve force. But yeah, um, it it doesn't get enough credit. This is a very good episode. It doesn't slow down. You don't get bored watching it. Time seems to just fly by when you're watching it. Yeah. The the music and sound effects is good. The only thing that it really lacks in is the costuming department, where both the Exelons and the Dalek costumes um, seem to have a little bit of issues. And I but, think that might have been because they were a bit hurried. Yes, they were a bit hurried, and it was at least only here and there. It wasn't always, I quote, always in the front. Matt, yeah. these are my final thoughts. Let me express them, please. So, all in all, this is um, better than a lot of what you get um, during this era, and uh, a lot better than what you're going to get during the 80s. So, yeah, I'm quite fond of it. All right. Ratings. All right, go ahead, Matt. What's your rating? Um, aside from a couple of shoddy uh, costume and prop points here or there and the silly child's maze, um, overall, the story and the rest of it fell together pretty quickly and pretty easily, I think, and... Yes, it makes for a far less bland story, and it also seems original enough to not be completely forced and borrowed. So, uh, I'll at least give it a four. Four flat? Yep. Yeah. 
Four flat. All right, Bill. I think I think I'm gonna put this one on par with last week with a three with a three point five. Just didn't do that much more for me. Uh, Tim goes with a four point five. All right, Tim with a four point five. All right, Aaron. You had asked me prior to the podcast what you rated Frontier in Space. You yep. gave Frontier in Space a 4.0. 4.0? Could you raise that to 4.5, please? I am giving you a retroactive <laughs> raise to a 4.5. Okay, right. because last and week you did, you did mention that you wanted to increase Frontier when you gave your rating on Planet. Yeah, because what did I give Planet then? You three. gave Planet a 3 flat. Yeah. Yep. Uh, this one I will give a 4.0 to, because I do feel it is it's not quite as good as Frontier in Space, but it is much better than Planet of the Daleks. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, I am going to actually give this one a 4.5 as well, which is on par with what I gave Frontier in Space. I believe there is that Frontier is the better of the two, but it is a minutial difference for me. In other words, um, this one would be a 4.3 and Frontier would be a 4.4 if I was going in tenths, which I'm not going to do. Because that opens up a bag of worms. Yep. So, with our powers combined... We give Death to the Daleks a 4.1. Hmm. Which, if you give me a moment, I will tell you where it fits on our uh, on our list. Okay. Well, you're doing that with that with uh, with Death included. That gives our average for the third Doctor a 3.85 to date which puts it at .35 above the average episode of Doctor Who. So I guess our average total is about a 3.5, uh, 3.51. Above All the right. average. Above average is good. This, by the way, will be our 106th entry. It is. So this is going to be the 106th title to be rated. Play some Jeopardy music. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we still have eight minutes. I'm sorry, the, the, it's very hard to copy and paste all this data because of um, how it copies through. Um, right. You copy it one way, it copies a couple of things and not the other things. So it's like, really? Uh, I will mention that of the uh, f five Sarah Jane stories you've done, this has the highest rating, mm -hmm. uh, with Sarah Jane having a 3.49 average, Death of the Daleks being the 4.1. Mm -hmm. All yeah, right, I, I, and yeah. doing our sort and shuffle. Uh huh. Death. Comes out at number thirty-two. Very high up there. Just above closing time and just below Mummy on the Orient Express. It hmm. is rated above Castrovalva and below uh, Army of Ghosts, Doomsday, and the Curse of Fatal Death. Because it's Curse so, of Fatal Death. Yeah, I know. It's just, 
that is the range it is in. Which is still a very oh. good range. Uh, Aaron's retroactive rays, by the way, has moved Frontier in Space up to number 23. Ooh. Woohoo! It is now between The Last Christmas, which it is, um, it is below The Last Christmas, and it is above Bad Wolf Parting of the Ways. Wow. Yeah, that's pretty damn high up there. It's above Legopolis, it's above the War Games. Mm -hmm. It is below Spearhead from Space and a bit below Tenth Planet. Still, that's some cozy company up in there. Yeah, it's getting lonely at the top. Our number one is still Caves of Androzani with a solid five. And our cellar dweller is still Journey to the Center of the TARDIS with a less than one. <laughs> less than one. Our number one Dalek story at this point being the Day of the Doctor. And our lowest Dalek story looks like so far is the Dalek's Master Plan. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Victory of the Dalek. Or Asylum of the Dalek 3.0. Uh, I was going to say. I thought it was a flop. But I don't think it was that hard of a flop. Oh, yeah. Asylum of the Daleks. Flop. Flop, 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 flop. I'm almost guaranteed that there's going to be something out there that's still going to hurt us on this. Des mm -hmm. Destiny or Evolution or, pro or Manhattan are probably going to be the... Uh, oh, God, Manhattan. Oh, my God. I'm having flashbacks back to Manhattan. This is not also, good. Also, we, we will be redoing Victory, of course, since that entire <laughs> recording was lost. So... Uh... Yeah, but now having listened to, listened to power and everything, we get to actually get better context on it than we did the first time around. Mm -hmm. This will also be my first time having watched Daleks in Manhattan since watching Evil. Okay. So I'll have brand new context on that. Okay, um, we should probably wrap it up here. Yeah. Yep. And if, uh, if you enjoy listening to us, you can uh, please consider subscribing on YouTube, Twitch, and uh, Mixcloud. And you can always follow and subscribe, uh, follow, like, subscribe, all that good stuff on uh, Facebook and Twitter at uh, Unearthly Podcast and Unearthly Pod. If you want to support us and help us keep going, you can always go on over to patreon.com slash unearthlypodcast. And don't forget to join us next week as we take a look at the fan favorite Genesis of the Daleks, once again written by Terry Nation. And one year later than this one. True. This was Pertwee's last season. That's Baker's first. Yep. Mm -hmm. So see you all then. See you all then. <laughs> it's going to be fun trying to do Genesis in five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and done. <laughs>